Uh, usually, I, I would want to ask someone why they got into brain science. You know, okay. what about the brain intrigued them? But I already know the answer to your because I've seen you talk about it on videos. Ah. So I'm going to leave that to the viewer to find those videos of you talking about why you got interested in brain science. Okay. It involves a fall. Uh, so instead, uh, yes. I would like to ask you, how did you obtain your sort of pseudo celebrity status you have in the science community? What was it that, did, were you working at that or would that just come along with the territory? I, I've always been very interested in public communication of neuroscience. So after, I mean, once I had a faculty position and so on, I started writing a book called Incognito, which was sort of a compilation of all the most interesting things that I um, had learned and put together theoretical frameworks, but I did it in a very different way than I write my academic papers. So I've written like 120 academic peer-reviewed papers. It doesn't have a particular style to them, and you know, six people on the planet read those. But I wanted to make something that opened it up so that um, you know my audience was essentially my 16-year-old self. I mean, that's who right. I was writing this for. Right. When I finished writing it, I thought, what if nobody cares? But it became a New York Times bestseller, and it yeah. became uh, a big thing. And so uh, that was a really cool thing for me to witness because it told me that people care about this stuff. It's really, you know, topics from what your brain is doing under the hood all the way to neuroscience and the legal system where they intersect. You know, I, I just I didn't know if anyone would care, but people really uh, care in the same way that I do about those things. So well, anyway, I certainly care, and I know my audience cares because right. we're all brain geeks here. So, right, great. Right. Uh, so let I know you're short on time. So without further ado, let's get on with it. What we're doing here is interview with a neuroscientist. I'm Matt Taylor, by the way, of Nementa, and with me is Dr. David Eagleman. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, really lucky to have your time, and we're going to jump right into it. So what, how this works is I've got four topics, okay. neuroscience topics, is okay. your name on it, I didn't want to get it mixed up. Uh, and so uh, I've got these topics that uh, are neuroscience-y, um, and we're going to go through them, and you can pick which one you want to talk about, and right. then we'll just kind of go from there. So the first one is the black horse of passion. Okay. For a thousand. Nice. Okay. Uh, the second one is your eyes smell beautiful tonight <laughs> for 500. It's kind of a cheap, cheap one. So it's yeah, low. Yeah, yeah. Uh, binary brains for 1500. And the last one is a handful of sheet <laughs> for 2000. And that, it, that's higher because I thought it was clever. So Got it's, it. it's your pick. Which one do you think um, you want to? Um, you can have them if you want to Well, around. let's see. I mean, uh, all right, well, let's, let's go in the order that they are presented. So okay. the Black Horse of Passion, what, what this refers to is the ancient Greeks had made this model where they said, you know, it's as though you are a charioteer and you're holding on to the white horse of reason and the black horse of passion, and they're always trying to pull you in different directions, and your job is to stay down the middle of the road. And to, that was the first reference I could ever find to... Uh, well, to this model that I built out more in, in incognito, but what I call the team of rivals model, which is to say your brain is actually built of all these different networks that have different drives. They're worrying about different things and they're always a competition. So what we have is this machine that's built out of conflict, which is very different than how we build computers and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's like a neural parliament in there where you've got all these different political parties, all of whom love their country, but just have very different ways of thinking about things. Right. We're the country that gets steered around by this. And this is why humans can be conflicted or, or nuanced or they can, you know, contract with themselves or cajole themselves or cuss at themselves, all the things that make humans interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's Black Horse of Passion. So what intrigues me about that is that it implies that there's some global state in your brain available to different players or different actors or different you know, urges that you have. That so there's something at the surface that every, that's being transmitted throughout the brain. I actually think it's not a global state. So, okay. so if I see some cookies on the table while we're talking, that's, that's a, that gets a thread running and I'm thinking about the cookies and whatever. Uh, but then part of me is thinking about, you know, oh, uh, you know, you want to get in shape for this upcoming race. And so don't do the cookies. And part of me thinks, okay, maybe I'll eat the cookies, but I'll, I'll go to the gym tonight. And yeah, all these things can happen even while we're talking. Mm -hmm. But it's not clear. But, but, but some of it's triggered by the cookie sitting there 
other networks get triggered by other issues that don't care about the cookies at all, but mm -hmm. care about, you know, what kind of person do I want to be or what am I going to do about this dinner tonight that I have mm -hmm. to go to and, you know. These are the unconscious drivers. Almost all of the team of rivals is happening unconsciously. Yeah. All the complex, nuanced things are happening under the surface. You don't even know until something battles its way up to the top and suddenly I think, oh, I've got the dinner tonight. Yeah. Or, oh, I yeah. just thought of something or whatever the issue <laughs> we is. We put yeah. such a big importance on the difference between consciousness and subconsciousness, but honestly, it's, it's not that big of a, of a factor, consciousness. <laughs> well, well, so yeah, much is going on underneath. Right. Too. Consciousness is like the, you know, it's like the broom closet in the mansion of the brain. It's the, <laughs> it's the mouth right. that you have. Act and, and the reason is, you know, you're built of a... 100 billion neurons and these are all doing very complicated things at, at scales of space and time that don't matter to us as these giant creatures. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we don't care at all about that scale. We're, we're dealing with things on a much bigger scale yeah. like mates and food and whatever else we're caring about. And so, um, yeah, it's not surprising that if you get down to the level of the code there, just doesn't mean anything to us, right? And and it's only uh, at the top of the stack that it has something to do with us, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, on on to the next card. All right, the next card. Your <laughs> eyes smell beautiful tonight. <laughs> I think you know what this is. I, I suspect this refers to synesthesia, <laughs> yes, <laughs> which is a a blending of the senses, and so um, common forms of synesthesia are, for example, where uh, people look at letters or numbers. And that triggers a color experience. So M is, you know, purple, and you know C is a red color, and F is blue, and so on. And it's different for every person mm -hmm. what the correspondence are between the letters and the number. It used to be thought this was very rare, but we now know that about three percent of the population has some form of synesthesia. There are many different that flavors. Seems high. Yeah. Well, it's you know three times higher than schizophrenia, for example. Huh. Um, the interesting part is that synesthesia is not a disease or a disorder. It's just what the, what's always attracted me about it is it's it's an alternative consciousness, just an alternative mm -hmm. way of having a perception is of the it, world. But is there's it no different wiring. Do those nerves actually go to different locations? It's you know what it is. It's not that they go to different locations exactly. It's that you have neighboring areas of the brain that take care of, let's say, you know, letters of the alphabet and colors, mm -hmm. and there's just more porous borders there. So is there's this just the cortex or other in, the cortex, in the cortex. Exactly yeah. right. Mm -hmm. So there's just more, you know more crosstalk between these areas huh. and and in 97 percent of brains there's there's less crosstalk right so it's more blending of the senses sort of yeah thing. exactly and so there are many different flavors of synesthesia uh you know you can hear a sound and it puts a taste in your mouth sure. or, or you taste mm -hmm. something it puts a feeling on your mm -hmm. fingertips or um you know common ones involve uh hearing music and and feeling like that corresponds to a particular shape or yeah like, you know, like a banner unfurling or sometimes physical things like oh when i hear a chord transition to that mm -hmm. it makes me feel like i'm squatting and then leaping and whatever yeah. this is what people report i don't have synesthesia but this but could I, be just because as a an entity learns something it, it makes these associations as it learns them. yeah the interesting part is the is the randomness of these associations right mm -hmm. so it's the you know the fact that you hear a chord transition that makes you feel like you're crouching and then leaping it's not a learned thing as in some adult told you that. Oh, I see. It's uh, yeah. like everybody sort of feels like that when they hear a, a, that type of music. Right? No, no. That's the point is that most people don't feel like that. Uh, when, when I, uh, do you feel like that? No, not all the time. Some music I really want to move to, though. Well, okay. But this is different. <laughs> okay, so this is with synesthesia. It's um, self-evidently true that this chord equals this body posture or oh, I see. that this it's note is this color of... It's a little more concrete uh, than that. It's yeah, not it's like I feel concrete. like I want to dance. It's like... Right, exactly. A... And, and the thing about the colors is that it's extremely specific. So it's like, oh, when I hear the, the note F, that is a silvery color like moonlight. And when, mm -hmm. I, when, when I hear the note D, that's... Um, you know, sort of like a red pomegranate color. Or yeah, they're, they're, people are extremely specific in what they're experiencing. So this is not something that is taught to them. Right. And in fact, what I've studied are synesthetes in the same family, like, you know, three sisters, for example. They don't have the same colors for the same letters. So uh -huh. that suggests that it's not... There's some environmental factor, but... Right. So, there, okay, that's exactly right. There is some environmental factor. And the reason that we were able to tease this out is because... So at this point, I've tested 36,000 synesthetes, and I've wow. their detailed colors and so on. 
And what you find is that there's no relationship between one synesthete and the next. But what a couple of colleagues at Stanford and I found is that um, there are people born sort of at the end of the late 1960s who all started having the same color palette, as in this letter corresponded to this color. Hmm. And, and that grew and grew to about 15% of synesthetes who were born in the early 70s had the same color palette, and then that died out. Hmm. And it turns out that color palette corresponds to the Fisher Price magnet set, which was on refrigerators <laughs> right at that time. <laughs> Holy and, cow. And, and all these people had printed on Everybody them. knows what those are in the Everybody United knows States, what they are. Anyway. Yes, but 97% of people saw those but didn't become synesthetic, right? Right, right. right. So <laughs> synesthesia is a genetic predisposition, but then there is some amount of imprinting that, that yeah. can happen. That's really interesting. Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Let's see. Binary brains. Binary Not, brains. Does this mean computer? Can you build a brain out of zeros and ones? Yeah, sort of. Okay, let me. Okay, let's do a thought okay. experiment. Let's let's say you cut someone's head off you know, and look at their spinal cord. Okay. I, I always like to visualize this as sort of a fiber optics cable of axons. Yeah. Right? And if you just yeah. freeze time and you cut it, some of those are going to be firing at yep. that moment. That's a binary stream. Oh yeah. Right. I mean, the brain is getting this massive binary stream from all of the. Oh yeah. That's like, and we, I mean, our computers, we get binary. So yeah. I'm just thinking there's all this opportunity in the future to hack brains and for brains to hack in, into machines both directions. Yeah, that's right. So, so yes, of course, you're exactly right that the, the main signals in brains are spikes, which are zero or one. Um, uh, but there are also are all these analog things in brains, like neurotransmitters that can do what's called volume neurotransmission. So, you know, here's a ton of neurons. And you get more dopamine in this region and that changes their behavior and so mm. on. So what's interesting about brains is it's this mixture of digital and analog signaling. It's sort of unbelievable to me because I've been in neuroscience for like three million years now. <laughs> and I thought when I was young, I thought, wow, we for sure are going to know the answers to all these questions by the time it's, you know, 2017. Yeah. But my gosh, we, there's so much that we don't know about just very basic things. Like what is this digital analog signaling Doing what is the language of uh, of spikes saying? Does an individual yeah. neuron matter, or is it the collection of lots of spikes that matter? Uh, very basic questions that we still right. don't know the answer to. Yeah, it's easier in the peripheral nervous system when you're talking about muscles. The more spikes you have, the more contraction you have. That's easy. Yeah. When it comes to things about thought and thinking about the future mm -hmm. and deciding what you're going to eat for lunch and so on, it's not clear at all. I mean, the, the representations of those thoughts in your brain are going to be totally different than they are in my brain. Right, right. It's not like we can transfer a mind read without something extremely complicated that's tuned to each individual. Yeah, exactly, exactly right. So I think in the super distant future, we're talking 500 years from now, sure. um, that the idea of can I upload information to you, like how to fly a Black Hawk helicopter, right. or whatever the equivalent is 500 years from now, um, if I'm uploading that information to you, first what I'd have to do is system identification, which is figure out everything that is your entire history of experiences and ideas and probably your genetics also, mm -hmm. all leading up to your brain right now, mm -hmm. really figure out that and then say, okay, well, to teach you how to fly a black helicopter, you would think about it as, okay, was that like that time I sat on a horse, I sort of pulled the horse this way and that way. But for me, it might be a completely different thing. I'm like, oh, is that time I sat on a sailboat and I yeah. pulled on this thing? And yeah, so it's like a really hard problem. I should do it that way. That's right. So maybe it'll become an easy problem after we have methods for system identification, but that's, right. you know, right. 300 years from now. Yeah. Everybody's brain works differently. Yes. Okay, last, okay, last, last topic. one. Um, a handful of sheep. I have to confess, I don't. <laughs> This is the most expensive one, but I don't have any idea okay. what this reference is. I, uh, okay, so I'm, I have props for this one. Okay. Uh, so obviously this is a brand, and this is the cerebellum. This is the, just the neocortex. This is what we always yeah. show. Like, if you just talk about the neocortex, yes. it's basically, this it's, always happens. Oh. It's okay. It's, it's basically like a, a dinner home. napkin, if you spread yeah. it all out, right? Yeah. So the thing that interests me is that it's, it's kind of homogenous. It's the same way, but then, but it's actually severed or by this the the what's it corpus callosum, corpus callosum, callosum, callosum yep. right yeah and so you've you've actually sort of got two brains that are wired together yeah that's right. and what is the function of of this thing and why did we evolve to have two different sides of the brain of the well, cortex specifically so so we are 
symmetric creatures around this axis. So we have two legs and two arms and two eyes and two ears and so on. And there are all kinds of advantages we get from that, you know, like binaural hearing and stereo vision and so on. Um, but it's something about the way this machine is built and unpacks that gives us this radial symmetry. Mm. Most, uh, most creatures have this sort of body plan, but there are other body plans. It can be like a starfish or an octopus or, you know, different spiders have eight eyes and so on. And, you know, there are lots of different ways it could be done, but for whatever reason, what worked really well on this planet was to have this symmetric thing. So in that sense, it's no surprise that our brain consists of these two halves that are essentially identical. There, there was a period of time when there was a lot of attention to this idea of right brain and left brain, but it right. turns out sort of apocryphal in the sense that the right brain and left brain are almost identical. And it is the case that with time, your right brain starts caring more about certain kinds of tasks and your left brain about certain kinds of tasks. Your left brain really cares about yeah. things that involve fine detail, which includes things like language. And your right is more things that are more crude, like big motor movements. But, but the part that they have in common swamps what they have differently. Yeah. I mean, the structure is the same on both sides. The structure is the same. And the interesting part, you may know this, but children who have what's called Rasmussen's encephalitis, which is uh, an intractable epilepsy that's in one hemisphere, a whole hemisphere, the only good solution for them is to remove a whole hemisphere of the brain so that all you have left is one half of the brain. Mm. And the surprise is that as long as you do that surgery before the kid is about six years old, the kid's totally fine. Wow. Totally fine. Wow. They have a slight limp on the other side of their body where they're now missing a hemisphere. Um, but otherwise, you can't do tell. Do they have to plug the, those nerve endings somehow into the other hemisphere? When they... No, what's interesting is uh, originally when they started doing this, you know, now there's a whole empty half of the brain. Here, yeah. So they put in sterile ping pong balls to support the brain. <laughs> Um, but, but then they realized they didn't even need to do that because it just fills up with cerebrospinal fluid wow. and holds it in place. Wow. You don't need to do anything. You just, just, you know, snip it and remove all the, t I mean, obviously there's a lot of, you know, very careful stuff that's going on. I'm exaggerating yeah. when I say they just snip it, but, yeah. but yeah, you remove all that tissue and someone can get by perfectly fine with one hemisphere. Another interesting thing in the separation is, you know, one side might get one sense or and the other side might be processing another sense, but language, for example, goes across the whole brain. Right? There's not like a center for languages. Well, it's funny because language is the one thing that is more lateralized than most things. So no. your language is almost entirely in your left hemisphere, so oh, you're right-handed. I'm wrong about that. Okay. Yeah, okay. so but language it, But is, there's some processes that it requires both senses to, I mean... Both, both halves of the brain? Yeah, both yeah, halves yeah. of the brain. Well, it is the case that your right half is involved... The left half that's very clearly involved in language, if you look at the right side on the equivalent areas... That's very involved in music. So if you get a lesion here, you lose the ability to understand or produce language. If you get a lesion here, you get an inability to understand or produce music, what's called amusia, yeah. instead of an aphasia. Yeah. It turns out that if you get a right-sided lesion damage to this part of the brain, uh, there's very subtle things. Like you can understand the meaning of what somebody's saying, but you lose the ability to understand the the prosody of speech, you know, whether somebody's being sarcastic oh, or right. not sarcastic. Tone like, of the exactly. Attitude. Exactly. Yeah. So you can still get by and understand language mm. without the right hemisphere, but it's better. But the thing, the thing I want to emphasize though is that this all develops and wires up through time. Uh, it's probably genetically predisposed to do so, but the point is that if you remove a hemisphere of somebody's brain, all of the functions that would have get you know been taken care of over on the southern hemisphere. Just things get rewired onto here, and mm -hmm. ends up being being no problem with it. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah, like you said, it's like the most amazing thing on our planet. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah, well, that's a good place to wrap up. Okay, uh, Dr. Eagleman, well, thank you so much for great joining talking us. to you. You're the first one in the series of, of interviews with neuroscientists. Okay, so good. Appreciate your time, All right. and thanks Cheers. for watching, everybody. Okay.